This is a film like no other. It tells the incredible story of a government turning its organs of state upon one of its own citizens for political expediency. It tells a disturbing story of political complicity and ruthless opinion manipulation against a young working class woman who, as a result of her ordeal, is now confined as mentally ill and at serious risk of dying. Because it exposes such sensitive material, some of the contributors fear for their own welfare, and some have remained anonymous. Despite the risks, it is a story which has to be told. It is important to briefly set the scene. A 27-year-old Australian woman, Chappelle Corby, landed in Bali for a holiday only to find 4.2 kilograms of marijuana in her bag upon collection. A nightmare began which is scarcely believable. The value of marijuana in Indonesia is much lower than in Australia. There was no motive. Chappelle is a non-drug user with no criminal record. She tested negative for everything. They refused to weigh her luggage. If it was heavier than when she left, they would have had to release her. She was illegally interrogated for nine hours. They refused to test the drugs for country of origin. If they were Indonesian, they would have had to free her. They refused to DNA or fingerprint the evidence. They refused to let her cross-examine customs officers. They presume guilt and not innocence, another breach of human rights. They refused to seize CCTV footage from the airport, even when Chappelle begged for it. They burned the evidence so it could never be used to free her. The judge had never acquitted anyone in 500 cases. They talked about sending a warning to other Australians, a clear political intervention. The 20 year sentence was more than murderers, rapists and terrorists often get. She will never have kids, never see them play, and will probably die in a filthy cell. What happened next? While Chappelle Corby deteriorated in a squalid cell, her government clinically managed the political fallout of these events at her terrible expense. For the first time, this film exposes the reality of what has previously been hidden from the public. It exposes what happens when an individual's human rights conflict with strategic political need. Governments sometimes have to take decisions based upon unfolding events. Back in 2005, the Chappelle Corby story was explosive. It was all over the media and was attracting comment by politicians in both countries. It was shaking the cultural divide and was beginning to create political friction and difficulty. Further, this was political difficulty between the two parties of a strategic relationship. Corby case put strain on Australian-Indonesian relationship, losing the plot with Indonesia, 
Howard's Neighbourhood Watch. Relationships between the neighbours keep getting worse. It is important to understand that Indonesia has the largest Muslim population in the world. Its relationship with the West is therefore of critical importance. Australia, by virtue of its geographical proximity, is the front line of that relationship. Australia's relationship with Indonesia is therefore of fundamental importance on the world stage. Yet here was a case involving a single young woman which was beginning to threaten that relationship or at least cause increasing difficulty. There is absolutely no possibility that the case wasn't discussed by the Australian government. There can be no possibility that the government didn't discuss it and determine a position and policy on it. Not to do so would have been a blatant lack of due political diligence. The political hierarchy of Australia had to have a position and had to manage the case from a political perspective. I don't think that this can seriously be disputed. Will Corby be the splinter in the Oz Indon relationship? Australia and Indonesia in mortal danger. Australia Indonesia relationship under severe strain. A dangerous gulf between nations. Diplomats put on backlash alert. In terms of functionality, it would be the following. John Howard, the Prime Minister, Alexander Downer, the Foreign Affairs Minister, and Chris Ellison, Minister for Justice and Customs, who of course AFP Commissioner Keelty reported to. Those are the holders of the roles you would expect to be involved. Obviously, there would probably be others too. Regardless, the outcome of the internal political debates which took place is clear enough. The government prioritized the strategic relationship with Indonesia ahead of Chappelle Corby and her human rights. At a purely political level, that is of course understandable. At an ethical, moral and human level, it is frankly appalling. In the case of Chappelle, it was decided early on by our government that in order not to offend Indonesia, in order to appease Indonesia, that they were willing to sacrifice an Australian citizen for the sake of political expediency. And more. The Chappelle Corby case arose just two years post 9-11. The impact of public focus on the huge scale criminality at Australian airports would have created serious problems for the Australian government and its ministers. The impact of focus on the huge scale criminality at Australian airports would have caused serious problems for commercial interests such as Qantas and the Sydney Airport Corporation Limited. An innocent Chappelle Corby would have created this focus. Once a political decision is taken, once a policy is agreed upon, collective responsibility of government is established. This is the norm across nations and certainly not limited to Australia. All relevant organs of state will be supportively deployed. These include the ABC, the AFP and others. Of course, ministers themselves swing behind the policy too. Once a political decision is taken, once a policy is determined, the organs of state are used to implement it. The heads of government agencies, like the AFP, report to politicians. Politicians create the national policies and set the agenda for the organs of state. This is entirely normal.
In 2010, a document emerged regarding Chappelle Corby, showing that orchestration across departments even included strict control of external communications. Let's examine how each of the major government departments were deployed against Chappelle Corby. When Chappelle Corby's lawyers pressed for information, Qantas Airways provided the total weights of her bags. Independent researchers cross-checked these against the maximum weight thresholds for her flight. Chappelle Corby's bags were found to be 5 kilos overweight on the Qantas system, but she had checked them in under weight. No excess charge had been levied. According to the records, 5 kilos have been added to her official weight after check-in. Neither Qantas, the AFP or the government ever provided Chappelle Corby this vital information. Hidden World Films informed her family in 2011. It's important to set the context. Here we had a young Australian woman before a foreign court whose life depended upon a very credible defense that drugs were placed in her bag by corrupt airport baggage handlers. There was a significant amount of evidence to support that. But suddenly, just a few weeks before the verdict, the head of the Australian Federal Police told the media that, quote, there is very little intelligence to suggest that baggage handlers are using innocent people to traffic heroin or other drugs between states." End quote. In itself, that was staggering. Its timing could not have been worse, and its impact on Chappelle Corby was devastating. The President of Law Council of Australia himself felt moved to comment on this. Quote, it was potentially damaging to the Corby defense, as it will no doubt be transmitted to Bali. End quote with Chappelle Corby's lawyer referring to it as, quote, an absolute disgrace, end quote. But with the advantage of hindsight, we can also now see that it made no operational sense either. In fact, it totally contradicted what was actually happening on the ground, so much so that many suggest that it was a political statement engineered by the government. For a start, the AFP via an operation known as Operation Mocha were actually in the process of investigating the very thing which Chappelle Corby's lawyer was suggesting. Former head of Australian Federal Police anti-organized crime operations, Ray Cooper, revealed that it was well known amongst his colleagues that unwitting passengers were regularly used as mules to traffic narcotics. Police were linked to those operations. There were narcotics, particularly cannabis, being moved from airport to airport by syndicates and the baggage handlers were playing a key role in it. These dates, investigators revealed of the Operation Mocha drug bust, were based on the work rosters of the corrupt baggage handlers at Sydney Airport. 
that very exact same day, Chappelle Corby flew from Brisbane to Sydney, then on to Bali. 4.2 kilograms of cannabis were discovered in her boogie board bag at Nurarai Airport, Bali. The head of the baggage handler Mocha operation was later arrested for conspiring to import $160 million of precursor drugs into Australia. So we also appear to have corrupt police on the scene, another development for which the parameters and boundaries were unknown. Well, now the arrest of a top Australian drug investigator, Mark Standen, was arrested at his desk over a conspiracy to produce $120 million worth of the drug ice. Huge amounts of money, huge amounts of drugs. I've been told repeatedly since the mid 1970s, uh, it began with the Stuart Royal Commission and other Royal Commissions, that uh, the Narcotics Bureau of that time uh, have permeated mainstream policing and the federal police. But this is a this is a two two prong problem. It's one about the State Crime Commission, but it's also a problem about the Australian federal police. Why has this been able to happen uh, without the public knowing? Well, you'd have to ask your media colleagues that because uh, there's been no shortage of attempts to let the media know. Uh, there's been no shortage of information. This was one of the biggest drug-related operations in the history of Australian policing. And Mr Keelty was well aware of it when he made that statement. He must also have been aware that the full parameters and boundaries of the airport drug syndication ring were unknown. So even at this level, his statement surely verges on the ridiculous from an operational perspective. Not only were the police actually investigating baggage handler corruption, but exactly the same thing had previously happened to others. Corby's defence team claimed there were baggage handlers at both Sydney and Brisbane airports smuggling drugs. But the federal police completely dismissed the accusations. Then came the bombshell. The same thing had happened before. But this Melbourne couple were lucky enough not to be searched by Indonesian customs. In June 1997, Eight years ago, Dee and Steve were unpacking after their flight to Bali when they were stunned to find a large block of compressed marijuana in their luggage. When we got to the motel room, my wife opened up the case, um, yelled out my name. I turned around and she had a package of marijuana in her hands, probably similar to the size of a loaf of bread. Just a big plastic bag and um, it was all quite firm and, and packed. The Melbourne couple reported their find to an Australian consulate official in Bali and his response left them stunned. Give me the bad news. He goes, well, you get caught with that, mate, and you'll be earning nosy goring for the rest of your life in jail. Um, and he suggested that I just throw it, flush it down the toilet, flush the whole lot down the toilet, get it out of, the, out of my possession, and don't go to the authorities under any circumstances at all. And their call was confirmed by the Australian consulate last week, after their story became public. and more. Alan Kessing never wanted to speak out about anything until he wrote a report damning the security at Sydney Airport. When the report was leaked, the damage went all the way to the top. Alan Kessing, bag packed, ready to go to jail for leaking a confidential report about slack security at Sydney Airport. It all began when, as a top customs investigator, he was selected to research dangerous holes in security at Sydney's airports. But two years later, when Kessing's confidential reports were leaked to the media, he was charged and tried. Found guilty of whistleblowing, Kessing was convicted 
under the notorious Commonwealth Crimes Act. Drafted in the overwrought era at the start of World War I to prevent the release of secret information, the Crimes Act still operates in the same way today. in by pointing out all the failings that it was going to cost uh, the airlines and uh, the, more to the point the privatized airport corporation um, big bucks to rectify now the point about it is that the rectification would merely have brought them in line with the requirements of the customs act but nonetheless they were rejected purely for commercial reasons and we were told that straight out when i uh, first heard of my reports being leaked two and a half years after the I wrote them. My first thought was, I think that was 31st of May, and unfortunately Chappelle would have been convicted on the 27th of May of 2005. My first thought was, somebody obviously had this story. Why didn't they, re they publish the story whilst the trial was still going on? And it is, it is well known. They use it, the corrupted personnel behind the lines in the baggage handling or wherever are using the domestic airports to smuggle drugs between the state capitals for instance that yes it's always been from the very bottom from the cleaners the guys who push around mops and buckets uh, right up to the top whether it's the commercial side such as the air, the airline staff themselves or even some customs officers I mean or quarantine for that matter but when I came back on duty in 2005 and when, the, when Chappelle Corby was on trial, and those officers who hadn't already resigned were absolutely consumed with, with anger, there's no other word for it, sheer fury that reports that we had submitted to point out exactly these vulnerabilities had now resulted in, in this, which we warned against over and over and over. It's, it's just... Um, a disgrace from beginning to end, the fact that this information was well known to customs officers and AFP for years, as is demonstrated by the occasional busts reported in the media in the late part of 2004 and the early part of 2005, showing imports of drugs using corrupt handlers or corrupt staff at the airport, and yet you can make a statement like that when somebody's life was in the balance over in, in Bali. It's just outrageous. If the Australian authorities had acknowledged to the Balinese court that there was significant doubt about the case, if they had simply admitted that the airport was full of holes, that baggage handlers were notoriously corrupt, as been, had been shown time and again in the previous months and, and even the previous year of drug importations using corrupt handlers, it must have cast massive doubt on any absurd notion that she was guilty. It could not have possibly have sustained a conviction with this knowledge. But the, the really awful thing about it is that if the, my reports have been acted upon when they were written two years previously, this situation would, should never have arisen. But the mere fact that these reports were suppressed for the worst of reasons, the cost to commercial entities and somebody is paying for it basically with their their life and their sanity now is an absolute outrage. And more. Gary Lee Rogers was a police officer who became a high-profile whistleblower when he alleged drug running at Sydney Airport and corruption within the AFP. He predicted that he would be murdered because of what he had discovered. 
Gary Lee Rogers, Assistant Inspector for Australian Protective Services, which was responsible for airport security until 2002, was assaulted by his work colleagues after blowing the whistle on Sydney airport corruption. I am in fear of my life, Lee Rogers wrote to Whistleblowers Australia. Today, at 1400 hours, I received an anonymous phone call, Gary Lee Rogers continued, saying that I had tripped over evidence of drug importation through Sydney airport involving the old Commonwealth Police Network. He sought a meeting with the Attorney General regarding his discoveries, but before this could be arranged, he was found dead. On October 1st, 2002, Gary Lee Rogers was found dead in his flat with a blood-stained knife, bloody pillow and two white plastic bottles in his right hand. To the shock of his family, campaigners and observers, the coroner decided that this was death by natural causes. The coroner also placed what had been called a gagging order upon proceedings and witnesses. Whistleblowers Australia sent some information to Chappelle Corby's lawyers, who complained repeatedly that the AFP were refusing to cooperate and were engaged in the cover-up. Whistleblowers Australia directly referred to Commissioner Kelty's apparent hostility. Even to this day, campaigners cite this case has been an unprecedented cover-up of police corruption and airport drug syndication. Then there are the Ray Cooper revelations. Former head of Australian Federal Police anti-organised crime operations, Ray Cooper, revealed that it was well known amongst his colleagues that unwitting passengers were regularly used as mules to traffic narcotics. Police were linked to those operations. There were narcotics, particularly cannabis, being moved from airport to airport by syndicates, and the baggage handlers were playing a key role in it. Ray Cooper, former head of the operations of the AFP Internal Investigations, revealed that it was well known by the AFP that unwitting passengers were being used as drug mules to shift drugs between airports. He also revealed that his investigation suggested that some federal police officers were in league with the smugglers. These are not isolated cases. There is also a long history of airport baggage handler drug syndication and AFP corruption. Wayne Sievers was a member of the unit at the time. You had um, theft of drugs, you had people running with criminals, you had uh, prosecutions that um, were compromised, you had um, a range of corrupt activities. The most recent allegations of systemic corruption came from former federal detective Alan Tashak he claims a long-standing cell of corrupt federal detectives has been ignored. He began an inquiry only to have it shut down and handed over to the Sydney office where corruption was endemic. It's to, it's to discredit the informants and, uh, and cover up the AFP's activities in Sydney. Many observers believe that the government's political motive was not only to avoid international difficulty with Indonesia, but also to avoid scrutiny of the AFP and airport corruption, with its inevitable domestic political fallout. Commissioner Keelty's comments, which were devastating for Chappelle Corby, made no operational sense at all. In fact, they conflicted with operational reality. But politically, they made every sense. That may be hard to accept for some people, but it is absolutely clear. But there have also been cases where baggage handlers at Sydney Airport have been arrested for, for using, you know, innocent human mules to carry drugs aboard for them. 
Yes, I, I mean, I don't know about that. You'd have to talk to the police. You'd have to talk to the police. You'd have to talk to the police. And two other operational points on the AFP. From an operational perspective, the smuggling of 4.2 kilograms of marijuana would surely have been of serious interest to any police force anywhere in the world. But there was no investigation, no raids on the Corby home, no arrests in Australia, nothing. How could this be? Perhaps the answer is that they knew she was innocent. If the Australian government really believed for one moment that marijuana was being sent from Australia to Indonesia, they would have had to have gone to Chappelle's home and searched it and searched a car. And they didn't do any of that. Police actions usually speak louder than words. The complete absence of a police investigation could only mean that they already knew the source of the marijuana and that it wasn't Chappelle Corby or her family. This leaves only two possibilities. That it was hastily placed by a member of the baggage handler syndicate, or that it was placed in Chappelle Corby's bag in Indonesia. And exposing either would have been politically damaging to the government at the time. Then there are the missing CCTV tapes, which Chappelle Corby begged for, but which the AFP were unable to provide. Why? Here we have an airport which is a major gateway to a Muslim state with the post-9-11 sensitivities in play, but more, a massive drug operation on the airport at the very same time that Chappelle Corby passed through. Yet no CCTV tapes? Are we really supposed to believe that? Perhaps the real reason is that the tape showed that Chappelle's bag was empty when she checked in. I am official, detectives of the fort. They knew earlier on why the girl was going to court. Out a corrupt drug smuggling ring at an airport And on the same day she flew overseas But the so-called honorable man, they let the evidence flow In a breeze Transport Minister took nine months and arrogantly dismissed my questions, refused to answer them and refused to indicate who was even responsible for the security cameras at Sydney Airport. In fact, he did a punctious pilot, Alex, and washed his hands and has now passed the poison chalice to Senator Ellison. Labor backbencher John Murphy and a spokesperson for the Justice and Customs Minister, Chris Ellison, told AM the Minister was unavailable for comment, but he is considering a response. Yes, that I don't honestly know, and I just can tell you what I've been told. I mean, honestly, I'm not the minister for the tapes. I'm not the minister for the tapes. I'm not the minister for the tapes. One single frame of an empty bag would prove that the drugs were placed either after check-in or by the Indonesians in Bali. Any police agency in the world would have an interest in the source of 4.2 kilograms of marijuana. But in Australia, there was no AFP investigation and apparently no interest at all in identifying those involved or responsible. 
Perhaps they knew that any such investigations would prove Chappelle Corby's innocence. In contrast, the AFP were very interested in helping to seize the much needed book royalties, launching a serious investigation and intensive surveillance operation. The operation was successful. Chappelle Corby's desperately needed funds were seized under proceeds of crime legislation. In December 2005, the police leaked a bogus story that photographs had been found which implicated Chappelle Corby in criminal drug activities prior to her arrest. The reality was that a petty criminal was one of many Australian tourists who had their picture taken with Chappelle while she was actually on remand in the Bali prison. The setting of some of the photographs was also obvious, but regardless, the story was run with shocking support comments from the AFP. If any evidence existed about Chappelle Corby, there was always a risk that it would come to light eventually. These photos do not appear to have been taken in a prison setting. The truth, however, eventually emerged. But the AFP had already helped to associate Chappelle with drugs in the public mind. Yet again, they had helped to turn public opinion against her. Last year, South Australian police seized the photos from Macaulay's house and handed them to the federal police. The 60-year-old says he only met Chappelle Corby whilst on holiday, after he and a friend attended her trial and struck up a conversation with Corby's mother. She came out and she said, oh, you're here to support Chappelle. Naturally, we're Aussies. They're the two people that we met offered to buy me a drink and they just seemed two nice blokes and we just sat and have a chat. McCauley says the pair later went with Ms Rose to Kerikaban Prison to meet Corby and to pose for the photographs. He says ever since news of the pictures went public he's been accused of prejudicing her appeal, which has made him physically sick. An angry Rosalie Rose travelled to Adelaide last month demanding police release the pictures. She's still furious at those who suggest McCauley and Corby knew each other before their Bali meeting. I had never known myself to cry so much. I was just so cranky that people just bluntly, just straight out, lie like that. Both McCauley and Ms Rose say the police knew where the photos were taken and should have revealed that publicly. The leak was also made during Chappelle Corby's appeal process and is considered to be a major contributory factor to her sentence being reinstated at 20 years. Chappelle Corby found out that she was back to facing 20 years in Krobokan jail last night, but her lawyer visiting the prison today said she was still shattered by the rejection of her final appeal. Both men blamed the Australian government and Federal Police Chief Mick Kelty for the appeal loss, saying that the emergence of photos showing Chappelle Corby with another accused drug trafficker had influenced the judges. No action was ever taken against any police officer as a result of this extremely damaging leak of false information. In Australia, Ackley is responsible for policing the place. In 2010, a formal complaint was lodged by a member of the public against the AFP with respect to Chappelle Corby. Details of the exercise and the final report were obtained by Hidden World Films in 2011. The investigation was entirely bogus. It comprised of an Ackley operative creating a script developed with an AFP officer. Almost all of the details recorded in the tiny report were demonstrably false. It was signed off by a functionary who was at the heart of the Howard regime during the Chappelle Corby case in 2005.
In 2005, a man came forward with the startling claim that he had been asked to collect the marijuana found in Chappelle Corby's bag from Sydney Airport. All I done is I was made the offer, I walked away and never got back in touch with him and that was it. Someone else done the job and uh, unfortunately one of the bags was missed and ended up in her bag. There was no intentions for the drugs to go to Bali and that's it, you know. Uh, the drugs were never meant for Bali. In a bizarre article, the Daily Telegraph broke this news. But the text under the headline discredited him with a series of unsubstantiated allegations. Mr Moss began a legal battle against News Limited, which lasts to this day. He later initiated proceedings against the ABC. I know Chappelle Corby is suffering in prison in Bali. Technically, really, that has nothing to do with me. I turned around and came forward to tell about an offer that was made to me at the time of her arrest, and that's all. And I have been running these cases at my own cost, with my own losses. As I've said many, many, many times, criminals do not come forward and give themselves up. But this idiot has. In March 2012, the Expendable Project obtained minutes from a meeting of the New South Wales Crime Commission. This proved that a secret recording had been taken of Mr Moss in 2005, discussing the marijuana pickup with an associate of Christopher Laycock, a notorious corrupt police officer later imprisoned. The New South Wales Crime Commission passed this corroborative recording to the AFP, also in 2005. However, the AFP did not disclose this to Chappelle Corby or the Indonesian court. Its existence remained hidden until revealed by the Expendable Project in 2012. Within days of the publication, the ABC reached a settlement with Mr Moss. Other legal action remains ongoing. It's, it's all been one uh, cover-up after another, and the bottom line is I think uh, Expendable has hit it on the head. The Howard government has turned around and uh, they're guilty, and I don't know how they're going to be held accountable. At the same time, the AFP engaged a prestigious Sydney legal firm at substantial taxpayer expense to prevent Chappelle Corby's family from gaining access to any further material relating to the case. Both the lack of the AFP investigation into the source of the marijuana and the missing CCTV footage clearly indicate the innocence of Chappelle Corby. Whether the marijuana was placed by baggage handlers or by the Indonesians in Bali, the political implication is huge. So you're saying, in effect, it's their job to do the bidding of the government? Um, their job is to work within the framework of, of policy, subject, of course, to not breaking the law. So is it their job to do the bidding of government as long as it's legal? Uh, in my view, it is. We have hugely damaging and ridiculous statements. We have missing evidence. We have repeated failures to investigate. We have leaking of false information to the media. We have failure to help her defense team when requested, and so much more. Given the sheer volume, it is hard to see how this could be considered to be anything other than a political campaign against a citizen in desperate need of help.
It is not unusual for a nation state to deploy its broadcasting organ to manage public opinion. This can range from subtle suggestion to blatant propaganda. Use of the Australian Broadcasting Corporation to manage opinion against Chappelle Corby to support the government position regarding its relationship with Indonesia therefore follows a well-established pattern. It embraces not only news output, but also culture and entertainment and guidance of commercial media channels. Government orchestration of commercial channels is primarily conducted through direct political contacts and perhaps through the ASIO, but sometimes the ABC is heavily engaged too. A number of established techniques have been employed, with one of the most obvious being the use of its Media Watch broadcast. In May 2005, when the public had directly viewed the reality of the Chappelle Corby case for themselves, Almost the whole of the Media Watch broadcast was dedicated to an assault on the commercial media. It made a range of staggering allegations against them, including being bought, feeding xenophobia, and slavishly following public opinion in supporting Chappelle Corby. It even defended the foreign system, which had so clearly abused Chappelle Corby's human rights. The message to the commercial media could not have been more clear. The requisite nature of future reporting could not have been more clearly indicated. This broadcast sent the same message to the ABC's own staff, whilst the position of the ABC board itself was starkly indicated by a column from board member Janet Albrechtson in a national newspaper. She defended the Indonesian regime and even wrote of Australians, quote, overdosing on compassion, unquote, in a shockingly hostile article. Janet Albrechtson had been appointed to the ABC board just a matter of weeks earlier by Australian Prime Minister John Howard. Another tried and trusted method to influence opinion is through humor and entertainment. The ABC were not slow to exploit this, using a variety of productions to embed subliminal acceptance of key messages. This has often involved direct ridicule of Chappelle Corby's family under cover of comedy and subtle references to create an impression of guilt and well-being. Examples abound, and even the internet is not sacred, with foul depictions of Chappelle Corby herself in banners and similar. Today, tonight, are on Jody's side. In the current affair, are on Mercedes' side. <laughs> and to represent these two, we've chosen these cheap, dim-witted dolls. <laughs> so after all that, what is the verdict? Well, they're both infuriating bogans. Oh, <laughs> and the last image was Chappelle Corby thinking about what her postal vote would be. <laughs> was when she got the other Senate paper, she tried to make a rolly. <laughs> <laughs> a bag of weed. Okay, 
four kilo bag of wheat. <laughs> Number two, how can we make Chappelle Corby feel better? Oh, is she a bit blue? She is. She wants to come home. The Prime Minister should be helping. He's not. Um, she is in prison. That does go with the territory, doesn't it? That is true. Uh, maybe we could smuggle in a bong. <laughs>
but defaming her sister Mercedes. After four weeks of hearings, Channel 7 and Today Tonight's outrageous claims have been exposed for what they are. A desperate grab for ratings at the expense of truth. I really hope that in future, Today Tonight, think hard before broadcasting attacks and lies about somebody. Never seen them smoke a joint? No. Never seen them have dope in their house? No. The godmother of my son. I trust her. I, I love the girl. She's beautiful. The whole Corby family. They're a beautiful family. For Jodie to do this, it's, it's, it's not good. Did Today Tonight then embark on a vendetta against the Corbys? Just a couple of months after the first interview, they lured Mercedes to a confrontation with Jodie and reporter Seymour. Their bait on this occasion was an outright lie. Despicably, the investigator hired by Seven claimed they'd obtained useful documents from a government official who had died in the Garuda air disaster. While the muckraking continued in Australia, in Bali, Chappelle remained in jail. Don't you, don't you feel you've been totally ridiculous no, with those not stories? At all. Not at all. something on um, on the six o'clock show whatever on the dri the drive show whatever it is on, on the evening of um, on the ABC and right. um, they they did a rebuttal on it at four o'clock in the morning oh, really? they apologized for their um, for the for their story at four o'clock in the morning is, is that so, when they broadcast the the apology that's when they broadcast an apology yeah one one such apology I forget exactly <laughs> oh my God. the um what they what they said, but they said it at six o'clock at night, and then they broadcast their apology at four in the morning. In 2011, the private investigator contracted by Australian television networks on the Chappelle Corby case broke his silence. It is, and I believe that he was paid by several others as well. But they don't always pay directly. Quite often, um, you know, the payments are made via third parties, i.e., someone like ourselves. You know, we're instructed to make the payments. So. Yeah. And uh, all of the networks were happy to throw uh, lots of lots money, of money at it. Yeah. Oh, anything to do with 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 the name Corby. Um, but uh, once again, we investigated that. I spoke to many, many people, and there was. No link between Macaulay and any of the Corbys whatsoever. Phone records were checked, dating back uh, eight years. And there is no way that Macaulay knew the Corbys. He's just lying. But none of them went anywhere. Not one single one. And we followed and you, all of these. Yeah, and you guys were actually wanted as much dirt as you possibly could rake up on the Corbys, yet you still didn't strike hater as you would say exactly when they were filming the Corbys did they ever find anything that suggests the Corbys were involved in drug smuggling in their covert operations no never not never 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 there was nothing and there was never one shred of evidence that ever came out that pointed us in the direction of Drugs, Corbys, ever. You're telling me that you told the television station that Kim was telling lies and they chose to ignore your advice and still ran with the story? That's correct, yes. I went into quite a bit of detail yeah. and uh, that was disregarded. I did so. caution them, I told them that Kim was telling lies. Um, I was encouraged to forget that. How did you feel about that? Well, it compromises us to the people that we work with. All of a sudden they're saying, well, don't do your investigation properly, tell lies. And the hardest part with all these lies that they are telling is getting the media to print the truth. Why do you think they don't want to expose them? Is it because they actually um, created them? Look, that's that's a fair point. That 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 is a fair, fair statement, actually. Um, I hadn't looked at it like that, you know, because they've actually created them. 
and more. Other direct witnesses told similar stories, including Jade, who courageously refused to lie when she was subjected to extreme emotional pressure. But yeah. what makes me so angry, she got money for this. Yeah, do you know how much she got paid? Did she ever let on there how much she got paid for these, yeah, these lies she told? I think she, she might have been paid about all told $60,000 or something. She did get paid. I know she got paid, yeah, yeah, she told me. So she actually said to you, if you lie for me, you're going yep. to get a lot of money. Yep, I'll get lots of money and I'll get my, this will help strengthen my case to get my son back. Did you wonder how telling lies would actually get your son back? Correct me if I'm wrong here. Yeah. If you lied and said that your ex-partner was a drug runner, then he would be unfit to be the parent. of the... That's correct. And then he would have been maybe charged and then you would have got custody. Is that, is that the emotional game they were playing? Yes. So that's the the that is what love. they used as a bargaining chip for you. Yeah, basically, yep, that was it. I wasn't going to, love, it didn't matter. Like I said, I love my son, I miss my son. I, lo I went through two years of hell for fighting with him only to lose the custody, hearing and everything, you know. Yeah. And as I said, I had a million and one reasons to lie, but I wasn't going to. That wasn't the way to go about it. Yeah, what, well, destroy somebody else's life to get your own life That's on track. exactly right. That's exactly right. Yeah. No. I tried to tell them that she was lying mm. and not to use her, mm. and they didn't listen. I had spoken to him, and in conversation, I told him that she was lying. And they didn't listen? They did not listen. And they I ran the to... story? Yep, they went with the story anyway. And how did you feel about that? I was so angry. You know, and then I could have set the record straight and I would have set it on camera, she's a liar. And then maybe Chappelle wouldn't be in jail. To this day, the same disproved fabrications and smears appear regularly. And more. A common method to influence opinion is through repetitive use of damaging terminology. The ABC and the media in general consistently use the term convicted drug smuggler, Chappelle Corby, with its stark connotations and endorsement of the shocking trial. Convicted drug smuggler, Chappelle Corby. The convicted drug smuggler, Chappelle Corby. Convicted drug smuggler, Chappelle Corby has... Convicted barley drug smuggler, Chappelle Corby. Convicted drug smuggler, Chappelle Corby. This is illustrated by searching Australian news sites on a variety of terms. The convicted drug smuggler Chappelle Corby. 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 At the same time, the ABC has repeatedly censored news which might prove to be helpful to Chappelle Corby and which might engender public sympathy or support. A typical example of this was the news suppression of the global protest for her. This was the first ever global protest in support of an Australian in the entire history of the nation. It was the first cyber-driven protest in history to end at the United Nations HQ. It was even accompanied by a groundbreaking video and presented to the UN by a pop singer. Yet, despite the massive volume of trivia and smear broadcast about Chappelle Corby over the years, 
It wasn't referenced by the ABC at all. Not even once. It was completely hidden from the public. Over a period of years, the government has funded trips to Jakarta for dozens of journalists. These have been referred to as indoctrination trips. Many have returned to produce extremely hostile stories on Chappelle Corby through the ABC, Fairfax Media and others. And more. By October 2010, Chappelle Corby was seriously ill. She is now helpless, hopeless, she feels useless, she feels alienated, she feels removed from the rest of humanity. She is in a situation where she could easily move forward to kill herself. That she should be moved to a special hospital like the mental hospital. Why? Because she's mentally sick. A last-ditch humanitarian clemency appeal to the President of Indonesia was an effort to save her life. But the ABC produced damaging propaganda on behalf of the prison, who derived substantial access revenue from the presence of Chappelle Corby. Incredibly, the ABC sought to downplay her grave medical condition, which was central to her appeal. However, the report also accuses Chappelle Corby of faking it. If she's crazy, in my opinion, she won't be able to do the activities here. But she is able to do her makeup and she is able to exercise. She should stop creating nonsense sensations because it will only hurt her cake. But the governor's criticism will be hard to ignore. Matt Brown, ABC News. This was a cynical trick. The prison story wasn't a story at all. It was old, having been run and discredited months earlier by other channels. But the ABC ran it as credible and as fresh news during a critical stage of the appeal. It was syndicated in Indonesia at the worst possible time. Then the cover-up. As soon as it had been syndicated, they edited the original web page to dilute and hide the original content but they were caught out by Google. With Chappelle Corby's life in the balance, the ABC had acted directly to tilt the scales against her. And the Australian Media Complaints Procedure? This is limited to individual broadcast which effectively prevents scrutiny of wider and serious issues. And of course, the Complaints Authority itself, a government agency. The ABC is an organ of state and, as such, has demonstrably supported government policy in undermining Chappelle Corby through a clear campaign of opinion management. It has orchestrated commercial channels, using subliminal messaging in entertainment broadcasts, engaged in hostile news management, and has censored supportive developments. It has been shown to have been central in shaping public opinion against her and, therefore, in contributing to her current desperate plight. TV and the newspaper and the magazine play their higher volume sales game. Why they ought to be ashamed for running down their nation dome. Prejudice to the chin. Of a girl coming home, but then for 
twisting the truth The media is well known The deployment of the AFP and the ABC in support of the government's policy to prioritize its international relationship with Indonesia ahead of the welfare of Chappelle Corby could not be more clear. However, government policy is equally applied across all relevant departments and areas. This includes those less visible to the public. Despite having a lower profile, examples of this do sometimes manifest in the public arena. One example of this was the seizure of Chappelle Corby's book royalties. These were intended to meet her enormous legal costs, enable a legal challenge, and pay for her mother to continue to travel from Australia to visit her. Yet, incredibly, Chappelle Corby was deprived of these vital funds. Now this girl writes her book, telling about her injustice case, while clinging to innocence. Full of hope and faith That our government's turned a deaf ear Saying, oh, it's just a proceed of crime Well, I say, what kind of injustice do we got going on here? Do they think that we're blind And we cannot see the dirt on their hands? Oh, do they think they got the right to play with for the first time in Australian history, legal action was taken to seize book royalties under, quote, proceeds of crime, unquote, legislation. In 2005, Chappelle Corby begged the Australian government to forensically test the marijuana for country of origin, which could have freed her. Despite having treaty provision to do so, they refused to act. But Howard was a lawyer, like John Howard's lawyer. He knew what was going on, and yet time and time again they kept on saying that they, they had no uh, influence with, it, with the Indonesian courts. And yet there was a, a policy which was signed in 1987, which is a treaty allowing them for that they must get um, a sample of evidence in murder or drug cases. If they apply for it, then it must be given. And the Australian government kept on telling the Australian people that they couldn't interfere. Well, they weren't interfering. They had every right to. The AFP could have asked for a sample and they had every right to ask for that sample of marijuana. Police turned it into a public bonfire, burning the items Corby was carrying when she was arrested in 2004. They included her boogie board bag and the 4.2 kilograms of marijuana customs officials found inside it. We don't have a chance uh, anymore to bring this evidence to the court when there is extraordinary. The evidence was destroyed on the orders of the Supreme Court, Chappelle Corby begged everyone she could to forensically test the evidence. But the government later represented this reality entirely differently.
and more. The Freedom of Information Act is intended to allow citizens to have access to information in possession of their elected government. In 2009, a test request was made for information relating to the AFP's dealings with the Indonesian National Police with respect to Chappelle Corby. Having exhausted all means of delay, the AFP FOI team eventually provided blank page after blank page and admitted blatant censorship. However, the rationale provided for this censorship was revealing in itself. The other government departments abuse the legislation in a similar manner. The Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. The Australian Communications and Media Authority. The Australian Broadcasting Corporation. The Australian Customs Service. The Director of Public Prosecutions. The Department of Transport. For the Australian Government, Chappelle Corby's 2006 appeal presented another political hurdle. It is now clear that the Australian Government's four guys for this situation were always intended to be the soft target of her Indonesian lawyers. This avoided confrontation with Indonesia, exposure of systemic AFP corruption and any blame for themselves. The Corby family were pressed into accepting what was presented as help. The services of an Australian QC named Mark Torwell. What transpired was shocking. Mark Torwell QC caused huge damage to Chappelle Corby's chances. He told the media that a member of Chappelle Corby's legal team had sought government money to pay bribes. This acute antagonism of the Indonesian legal system had predictable results for Chappelle Corby in the Indonesian court. We've had, at her appeal, it is alleged that uh, an Australian government appointed to Queen's Council um, made public statements that were not beneficial to Chappelle's case. In fact, were blatantly detrimental to her case. Mark Trawell is a past member of the West Australian Liberal Party and long-term friend of Chris Allison, the Justice Minister. Trawell was later reprimanded by the State Administrative Tribunal for this appalling act, which even had it been true, was a clear breach of client confidentiality. This mere reprimand by the establishment for such disturbing and serious misconduct was roundly condemned by many observers. For Chappelle Corby, once again, the consequences of someone else's actions were devastating. 
The government had again avoided scrutiny of AFP and airport corruption and destabilisation of its relationship with Indonesia. Between 2001 and 2005, there were 360 white powder hoaxes in Australia. On average, that is one envelope containing harmless powder every few days. This commonplace type of incident attracted no or little comment from the government and little media interest. In June 2005, one such envelope arrived at the Indonesian Embassy. The note in the envelope contained no reference at all to Chappelle Corby. It was even written in Bahasa and not English. The powder was basically flour. The government's reaction was staggering as they seized upon it instantly. Foreign Minister Alexander Downer referred to it during the afternoon as, quote, a biological agent, unquote, with Prime Minister Howard blaming, quote, murderous criminality, unquote, on Chappelle Corby supporters. At 6.35 p.m., an email from the National Manager of Intelligence with the Australian Federal Police advised the Minister for Justice that, quote, Gram bacilli is a commonly occurring bacteria, unquote, stating that there was no hard evidence that it was dangerous. Instead of immediately correcting their highly damaging statements, the government allowed the original stories to roll, with headlines across the world attributing blame to Chappelle Corby's supporters for a biological attack. Protests for Chappelle Corby were abruptly halted as the public were alarmed at association with terrorism. The government had successfully undermined the emerging support movement. To this day, they have refused to say where the term, quote, biological agent, unquote, came from. They refused to explain why they didn't refer to the non-English note and non-reference to Chappelle Corby. They refused to explain why they didn't reference the hundreds of other harmless powder incidents. They have never explained why they allowed the false story to roll around the world when they could easily have corrected it at the outset. In advance of the appeal, the government received new and important evidence about Chappelle Corby's bags. They were informed that there was no record of the boogie board bag on the Sydney International Airport system. The other bags were all recorded normally. There was no screening or other record for this one bag. No record of it at all. But Chappelle Corby's lawyers had only been told there was no data. They were unaware that this only applied to the boogie board bag, that there was now cast iron evidence that the boogie board bag was treated differently behind the scenes. The government realised that this evidence was important. They realised the implications. The Minister also asked AFP Commissioner Keelty what amounted to, who else have you told about this? Neither Chappelle Corby or her lawyers were ever made aware of this evidence. It was never submitted to a court. It remained hidden until revealed to Hidden World Films in October 2010. With so many government departments deployed, and on an issue as politically charged as this one, it is unlikely that ASIO, the Australian Security Intelligence Organization, would not also be used. 
Indeed, allegations are rife that this shady government body was directly or indirectly involved in threats to the Indonesian embassy in 2005, which were presented to discredit Chappelle Corby's supporters. Others suggest that even to this day, they actively monitor and take steps to fragment supporter groups. We monitor our access logs very carefully. Every day they take copies of the Women for Chappelle blog. Every day they hack it with Site Ripper software. Because of the political potential of the case, we have been designated as subversive and intensely managed. This has included electronic monitoring, group infiltration, internal group influence, and undermining of those supporter projects deemed to be of significant risk. Recently, we have seen pro-government counter-influence directed specifically at group members. The pattern of events is so clear that there is absolutely no doubt this has taken place, and it still does. Yet many people are completely oblivious to it. Chappelle Corby supporter groups have been managed as intensively as terrorist cells. Despite the underground nature of their activities, there is an increasing body of evidence to suggest their long-term involvement in this case. On behalf of the Corby family, I have many times made complaints to the Commonwealth Ombudsman regarding various government agencies. Throughout, the Ombudsman's department have dodged, delayed, evaded. They have failed to take any of the complaints seriously. to be nothing more than a rubber stamp. It seems the Australian government and their departments are unaccountable for their actions and for what they've done to Chappelle Corby. Then there is the never-ending list of statements from senior politicians and ministers ranging from unhelpful to extremely hostile and damaging. Here are just a handful of them. Judge the clemency, put her life into his heart. But her life was in his hands instead. While she pled, I did not pass along. Be brave, should help be brave and try to stay so strong for the truth. 
job I need yeah, you suffer is also very wrong keep fighting in that prison and keep your spirits high we know that there will come a day when back home you will fly in September 2011 Files documenting dozens of breaches of Chappelle Corby's human rights were submitted to the Australian Government and to over a hundred MPs and Senators. These included breaches at the Bali trial and current abuses in prison, such as forced display to the media for prison PR and for public curiosity, which would also flout the Geneva Convention in a war scenario. Not a single response was forthcoming. saying in effect it's their job to do the bidding of the government? Um, their job is to work within the framework of, of policy subject of course to not breaking the law. So is it their job to do the bidding of government as long as it's legal? Uh, in my view it is. In my view it is. In my view it is. There can be no doubt that in 2005 the Australian government took the political decision to protect a political relationship at the terrible expense of Chappelle Corby. As with all government policies, all the organs of state were deployed to support it and were lined up directly against her. The effects on her have been devastating. Even though we have presented only a partial list, the scale of government activity against Chappelle Corby is staggering. It is also important to understand that when a government sets the tone and agenda for an issue, the establishment and large commercial interests within that nation invariably adopt a supportive position. Chappelle Corby and her family have not only had to endure a terrible ordeal in Indonesia, but the vilification and hostility of a second state. This shocking truth is finally starting to emerge. But with Chappelle Corby now suffering serious health issues, it may well come too late to save her life. Well, if you're the kind that feels unsure, why not sit alone and let the dingo call? Your memories of a wrongful conviction from years before. people stop standing up to injustice then it's all over we might as well just you know crawl back into the slime from whence we emerged two thousand seven saw a change of government in australia but there was no change of policy priority the new government has apparently abandoned her too. The 
say they've lost patience with Kevin Rudd. They say when he was opposition leader, he promised to do everything he could to further Chappelle's cause. Now that he's Prime Minister, they say their letters go unanswered. In Bali, Mark Burroughs, Nine News. Late in 2009, Chappelle Corby was declared mentally ill by one of Australia's most eminent psychiatrists, who stated clearly that she would die unless she was released. Dr. Jonathan Phillips, former president of the Psychiatrist Guild of Australia and New Zealand. She is now helpless, hopeless, she feels useless, she feels alienated, she feels removed from the rest of humanity. She is in a situation where she could easily move forward to kill herself. She should be moved to a special hospital like the mental hospital. Why? Right. Because she's mentally sick. Yet incredibly, she remains there, in conditions barely imaginable. For nearly a week, she's been treated for depression. The doctor wants her to be transferred to a psychiatric hospital because he says her mental state is so bad. Chappelle Corby is suffering prolonged mental torture and for her to be kept in the place that's caused it is beyond cruelty. Her life is in serious danger. Two months ago, just days before her 34th birthday, Chappelle Corby broke into a prison drugs cabinet and consumed everything inside. Her first drugs overdose. Her family praying. Corby spent two days on the floor of her cell. Her inmates afraid to raise the alarm. No doctors, no hospital. By the end of the week, her condition had worsened. She'd taken a week's worth of her own prescription antipsychotic drugs, meant to be guarded and administered by a trusted cellmate. Two years ago, Chappelle was diagnosed as insane, depressed, psychotic and at risk. He clearly is looking at death as in many ways a preferable option. She is dying a slow, torturous death in squalor, devoid of human rights, and ignored by governments. I can survive it here.